Can I welcome everyone to the 10th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mob mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? We've received apologies from Richard Lockhead and Claire Adamson is attending in his place. Liz Smith will join us shortly and Tavi Scott will only be here for a short time as he has stage two amendments to debate in another committee. The first item of business is a decision on whether to take agenda items four and five in private, which is a review of the evidence here today and also consideration of the work programme. And it's everyone content that agenda items four and five are taken in private. Thank you. The next item of business is a briefing from Audit Scotland. And can I welcome Cardinal Gardner, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for, for Scotland, Anthony Clark, Assistant Director, Tricia Meldrum, Senior Manager, and Rebecca Smallwood, Senior Auditor, Audit Scotland. The purpose of this session is to allow the Auditor General to brief the committee on her report and allow members to ask questions on the findings. I understand that the Auditor General will first make a short statement. Improving outcomes for children and their families is a priority for the Scottish Government. My report with the Accounts Commission on Early Learning and Childcare looks at how the Scottish Government expanded free provision to 600 hours in 2014 and what impact this has had on children and parents. It also looks at, the planning, at planning for the expansion to 1,140 hours by 2020. The Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 increased funded early learning and childcare. From August 2014, entitlement rose from 475 hours to 600 hours a year for all three- and four-year-olds and for eligible two-year-olds, estimated at 15% of all two-year-olds. From August 2015, eligibility expanded to around a quarter of two-year-olds. We found that the Government and Councils worked well together to expand provision and parents are positive about the benefits for their children. Parents in our research reported a range of benefits, including improvements in cognitive development, in social skills, in behaviour and children being better prepared for school. But parents reported a limited impact on their ability to work due to both the number of hours available and the way in which those hours are provided, such as half-day sessions with fixed start and pick-up times. The Government has invested almost £650 million of additional funding since 2014 for the expansion to 600 hours, but it wasn't clear about the specific outcomes it expected to achieve for children and parents. When the expansion was introduced, the Government stated that improving outcomes for children and for parents were equally important objectives, but there is a potential conflict between them. Improving outcomes for children means focusing on quality, while flexibility is more important if the aim is to improve outcomes for parents. The Government has now stated that the primary aim of the further expansion to 1140 hours is to improve outcomes for children. The report highlights the lack of options appraisal to inform the expansion. The Government implemented the increase to 600 hours without comparing the costs and the outcomes associated with different ways of achieving its objectives. There's a lack of clear evidence that increasing the number of funded hours each week for children already receiving early learning and childcare improves their outcomes. The evidence is clearer that starting earlier can benefit children, particularly those in so lower socioeconomic groups or with poorer home learning environments. The government could have considered other ways of achieving its objectives, such as earlier access to funded early learning and childcare for all children for fewer hours, or earlier access to more hours for those children who are likely to benefit most. The Government didn't plan how to evaluate the impact of the expansion to 600 hours or make sure that baseline data was available, so it's not yet clear whether this investment is delivering value for money. The Government has done more to plan how it will evaluate the expansion to 1140 hours, including publishing some baseline data. The Government and Councils are working hard to plan for the expansion to 1140 hours by August 2020 but councils had to prepare their initial expansion plans in the absence of important information about how the system will work from 2020, such as the quality standard expected, the flexibility required, and how the new funding follows the child model will work. Given the scale of the changes required, we feel the government should have started detailed planning with councils earlier. Council's initial estimates of the costs of delivering 1140 hours are around £1 billion a year, which is significantly higher than the government's figure of around £840 million. Councils estimate that they will need 12,000 extra whole-time equivalent staff and £690 million for changes to infrastructure, while the government expects that the expansion will need between six and 8,000 more staff, and it's initially allocated around £400 million for infrastructure. 
Some of the differences between these figures are due to different assumptions about flexibility, workforce and the uptake of funded places by eligible children. The Government and Councils are now working together to develop these plans, but it's clear that the expansion will require a significant increase in staffing and infrastructure over the next two and a half years, and it's difficult to see how this can be achieved on time. Convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer the Committee's questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just ask you one question, I think, and then I'm going to pass you on to Tavish, if Tavish has got any questions, because he's going to be going away uh, quite soon. You, you, you talked about the difference in figures. <laughs> I know, that sounds a bit severe, really. Uh, uh, you talked about the difference in, in figures between the local authorities and, and the government. Why is it that the report is being based basically on the local government figures, as opposed to why are we sort of like seem to be taking that as being the correct figures and the government figures as a shortfall? And could it possibly be anything to do with the way that both of them are measuring the potential uptake? Are the local authorities suggesting a higher uptake than the, the central government is? I don't think we're saying that either figure is right. We're simply pointing to the difference between the two. Um, and in some ways, I'm not surprised there is a difference between government and councils at this stage. Um, what we say in the report, though, is that councils didn't have some of the information that they needed about quality, about flexibility, and about how funding follows the child will work. Um, and that uh, leads to some of the differences. We also know that councils have done their modelling from the bottom up, whereas the government has done it um, from the top down. Um, and given the short time available and until August 2020, um, we think that makes it harder to get the right staffing and infrastructure in place on time. They've now got to the stage where they're both working closely to try and get this. They are at the moment, yes. Right, thank you for that. Tavish? Thank you very much, Kavita, and I apologise for having to, to disappear off. Um, uh, just two, two, two very brief questions. The first relates to the convener's question. Um, on workforce numbers, uh, there, there still appears some discrepancy between, the, again, the numbers produced uh, and talked to by government ministers and, and, on the other hand, by your report. Can you shed any light on, on that discrepancy? And more to point, what's going to fill it? Um, when you were going through this exercise, um, did Audit Scotland come across the, the, the I suppose, the, the aspects of both training and other policies that are in place to make sure that we do have enough trained work, 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 uh, staff rather to, to, fulfil the, uh, to fulfil the policy. I'll ask Rebecca Smallwood to pick that point up, if I may. So you talked about the, the difference between the council estimates of the workforce and the Scottish government's estimates of the workforce. Part of that difference um, is due to count the council figures that we have in the report also include central staff, so that would include the likes of administration staff, who also who aren't counted in the government's figures. They're purely estimating the number of practitioners. There's also different ways that they've modelled it. What we know the government has done is they've taken a sort of zero-based approach, and that looks at how many hours a day will a practitioner be delivering early learning and childcare, and that works out at six of the seven hours they're employed. How many weeks of the year they would be able to provide that for. It then looks at the existing workforce and the potential new workforce delivering at that same level of productivity, taking into account the number of hours that will be needed for the 1140 expansion and then working out how many practitioners you would need. So it assumes there's potential to make efficiencies in the way that people existing at the moment work. The council's approaches are not always explicit in their plans, but where there is information on that, they've taken the model that they currently have for staffing and then they've scaled that up for the expansion to 1140, taking account of the change of ratios if they're providing a longer day. So they've basically taken different approaches to the modelling, and that will explain some of the difference between the figures. Look, that's a helpful answer, but I, that suggests to me that the point about flexibility hasn't been taken into account because, um, <coughs> at whatever level, because um, small uh, nursery classes in small schools in many parts of the Scotland that, we all, that many of us represent will be very different from big nurseries here in Edinburgh. And it doesn't strike to me, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that that model you've just described will take into account the difference between having four kids in a class and lots, lots more in the middle of a city. The extent to which they've taken into account flexibility in the Scottish government's model is it looks, it assumes, I think, an hour a day per child to account for flexibility. But I don't think there's any difference in terms of how they've modelled for rural versus city yeah. areas. OK, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Gillian? Yep. Following on from, from Tavish Scott's line of question around the sort of variability, you f obviously it's va a variable picture across different local authorities. And um, I, I wanted to ask, is there 
in terms of the take up of the, the eligible two year olds, is, is it a similar picture? The same local authorities that are offering more flexibility, having more of a, a percentage of the, the eligible two year olds um, accessing nursery, or is that completely off the mark? It's worth saying, first of all, that um, understanding how many eligible two-year-olds are taking up their places is not as straightforward as we initially assumed it would be, um, because uh, the number of <coughs> children eligible depends on um, factors which are individual to each child and family, the benefits they receive, whether they're looked after children and so on. So knowing how many are eligible is not straightforward. Um, I'll ask the team to pick up the question of the variability across local government as well. And has n n not just about the, the eligible two-year-olds, but people actually taking up their nursery places in general, not just three- and four-year-olds as well. The problem that we have is with the way the information is collected at the moment. So we don't know how many children exactly are eligible in each council area. We can tell for two-year-olds, we know what the uptake is of two-year-olds overall, but not all of those two-year-olds are eligible. So it's hard for us to compare across councils. The councils that have a higher uptake of two-year-olds may well have a higher number of eligible two-year-olds. So that makes it difficult for us. It's also hard to quantify necessarily which councils are the most flexible. The information that we've got shows some of the models that are on offer, but what proportion of all places are available using those different models? So what proportion of places are open from eight till six or eh, nine till four? Or what proportion are half day? That, that's harder for us to quantify. Why is it difficult? What when the council's not given you that information? I mean, it seems to be seems to me a, quite a fundamental thing when you're looking at something to be able to go from that base point of knowing how many how many children are eligible, how many nurseries offer flexible places. The councils don't know which two-year-olds are eligible within their area. There are issues around information sharing between DWP and HMRC and the councils themselves. So councils have got a variety of strategies that they're employing to um, promote uptake with eligible two-year-olds. But we know that one of the reasons for the lower uptake than anticipated is that parents don't necessarily know that their child is eligible. Make it difficult for the government to do the work that you're saying that should have been done in terms of actually um, analysing the, the take-up if, if that information isn't there. There's a broader issue beyond the two-year-olds, which is data on the actual activity levels uh, of funded early learning and childcare across the whole of Scotland and within individual local authority areas. Um, I'll look to Rebecca to correct me if I get this wrong, but the data is gathered on a, an annual census, which simply captures how many children are registered in different settings at a point in the year. Local authorities do not necessarily have good and reliable data from their their partner providers about the number of parents that are using funded places and are paying top-up activities in, for early learning and childcare. Now, this is really important information for local authorities to understand um, what capacity there is in the system at the moment and what gaps there might be to move forward to the 1140 expansion. It's something the government and local authorities are aware of. It's something they're working through as part of their expansion planning. But there are very significant issues around data availability to inform appropriate and well-informed planning. OK, thank you. Can, can I just follow up on, on that about the flexibility and, and the fact that the councils don't seem to, you don't seem to get the information from the councils about how flexible. I, I accept the whole point about the DWP and um, the two-year-olds, but surely the councils must know how many of their providers are open from eight to six at night and stuff like that. That sort of information must surely be available to you. That, that information is available and the care inspector collect information on that. The issue is that within a setting that's open those hours, they might not have places for all children for those hours within the setting. So it might just be a small proportion that are offered the extended provision and a large number may well be getting a part day place and that information isn't collected consistently. Okay, so when, as we move forward, that information has got to be given to the local authorities. The local authorities have clearly got to start gathering that information in, in some way. Uh, Mary, you wanted to come in? Yeah, so on, just to go back to the workforce issue, to pick up something that, um, that, sure. that Tavish Scott um, had said. And I just want to be um, really clear in, in the, the, the difference between the figure that the Scottish Government estimates will be needed to um, deliver the 11.40 hours and, and local authorities are saying it's 12,000. So there's a 4,000 difference between the two. And I just want to be absolutely sure. In a previous answer, um, Ms Smallwood said that 
Um, a lot of that was down to the councils or local authorities, including administration staff in, in that estimate. Is that correct? The, the, that the council's figure does include admin staff. So is well. that 4,000 admins? No. 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 Some of the difference is because of the inclusion of admin staff. Some of the difference will also be because they've taken different approaches to modelling how many staff they need in the future. So the government's approach assumes that the existing staff might be able to deliver ELC more efficiently, potentially. They've taken a, a uniform approach to this as a number of hours a day that someone can do it. The councils have looked at what their existing staffing models are and then have adjusted them to take account of changes to staffing ratios because if you're in a longer day, then there needs to be more members of staff. But if, if the purpose of increasing the hours is to improve outcomes for children, surely more staff will be needed. Um, and it, it, would, it would seem um, a huge underestimate that 8,000 whole-time equivalent staff can deliver the level of care um, and education that is required for the increased amount of children that would be in the system to improve outcomes. Mm. At the moment, um, what we know, as Rebecca has said, is that the government's figure is based on using a standard assumption about the ratio, effectively, of staff to children um, across Scotland, whereas the council's figures are built up for each of the 32 local authorities on taking the provision they've got, but scaling it up from 600 to 1440. Um, as Rebecca said, there's also a difference because of the uh, inclusion of admin staff in council's figures. I think some of the difference will come down to quality, some will come down to flexibility, and some will go down, be down to the fact that there is an element of negotiation here as well about the funding that's required. But there's the... the um, point we're making is that there is a gap. We suspect the Scottish Government's figures are on the low side and there isn't very much time to get those staff in place before August 2020 anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I would have expected that both the Government figures and the local authority figures would use the same basis to calculate staff to children ratio, that there wouldn't be any difference because it would seem that one is calculating it slightly differently. I think it's a question for government. Um, I, can, I can see there may be an element of flexibility that's possible in some nursery settings, and the government will want to be understanding that. But equally, for us to be now 18 months away from the point where the 1140 entitlement is, in, is meant to be delivered, um, with that bigger gap between the staffing assumptions that the two parties are working to, seems to us a problem which makes it harder to um, get the childcare in place by August 2020. And just the, the final thing I wanted... Um, to, to ask in your opening um, remarks, you said that the government should have started planning with councils earlier to meet the target. Um, and, and while I accept I'm asking you to speculate, do, do you think there is a danger then that the target will not be met of 1140 by 2020? We say in the report we think it will now be difficult. That's not to say it can't be met, but there's an awful lot to be done in terms of training and recruiting the number of staff required and extending, improving or building new buildings for nursery prov provision where that's needed in parts of Scotland. We know from the amounts of money involved that both of those are, are big pieces of work. Um, as we've been discussing, there's still differences of view about how much investment is needed, but 18 months isn't a long time to do it, particularly when all councils at the same time are trying to increase their provision by that amount. And recruit and train staff. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz and George. Uh, thank you, Convener. And can I just apologise to uh, the witnesses and to colleagues for a slightly late arrival this morning. Um, can I just drill down on some very interesting comments that I think Ms Smallwood and Mr Clark have just identified in terms of the data? Because obviously data, the accuracy of data is crucial in terms of guiding the policy. Um, you've uh, given us some idea of where you think there are discrepancies. C could I just ask a little bit more detail around this? Is it your impression that there, there are considerable difficulties in the information that ought to be coming from the DWP and HMRI, uh, HRMC to be able to inform councils? Or is that data there in your opinion and it's not being extrapolated correctly? What do you feel is the problem in getting hold of that crucial information? The issue is around data sharing, but this is probably something that would be worth picking up with the Scottish Government as well, because they'll have more of the detail. I know that there have been discussions ongoing between the Government and DWP around this, and they might be able to give you a more up-to-date picture in terms of progress with that. Given you say it's around data sharing, is that likely to be an increased problem, given the data protection changes that are coming in? Uh, in May this year? I'm not sure if that will cover it You're or not. not. Sure. 
Um, secondly, I, I, th I feel very strongly that there are, there are really two issues here. The first is that the, the, the data which needs to be collected, uh, we have to improve the accuracy of that from a policy angle. But also it's important in ensuring that the parents who do have eligible youngsters know what their entitlement is. Could I just ask you if you feel that there's a lot more work to be done on the second of these, that in, in ensuring that parents are actually aware of what their entitlement is and whether there needs to be a lot of changes made to the way that local authorities act in ensuring that happens? Two-year-olds particularly, um, information for parents about that entitlement is key in getting up from the around 10% of eligible two-year-olds to um, two-year-olds who are eligible to 25%. Um, and some councils have done some um, very good work. But I think the evidence we heard from parents was that it was an issue more widely for parents of three- and four-year-olds as well. I'm looking to one of the team to... Yeah, Trisha. <coughs> I think, obviously, this is a very complex area, very difficult for, for parents to navigate their way through it, what they're entitled to, what options are available, etc. So we do have a recommendation about um, councils and government helping to make that information clearer for parents to help them actually understand what they're entitled to and, and what options are available to them. So just on the last point, do you, do you feel that when we're told that there is a 97% uptake of registration uh, for uh, funded places, do you, do you get the impression that that 97% is an accurate statistic? That's, that's as Anthony said, that's based on a census at a point in time. So, so it's, it's done once a year, so that's, that's the number of um, registered children at that point in time we don't know how many children that is there's an element of double counting in there as well so children could be registered at more, one more than one place um, so is this not quite a key point though in terms of identifying um, exactly where uh, those eligible children are and there's some work going on to look at improving that data so we're aware that Scottish Government and councils are working together to improve some of that data recording around um, update up Take um, um, uptake of places, registrations, etc. Do you have any idea when that's going to be complete? I think it will be in place around about the, the 2020 expansion date. Okay. It's, it's okay. Thank, you, Convener. Thank you. Can I just follow on for that then? The, quite right about the information has to be out there for parents and stuff. How, how do we get that if there is this barrier between the information sharing from the DWP to the Scottish Government and local authorities or, or, or whoever it may be that's responsible for it. Yeah, I mean, we can't get the information out unless we have it. Evidence, I think, from, from the research that Rebecca and Trisha have mentioned is that one of the best ways of getting people aware of their eligibility is using people like um, health visitors and staff that will be engaging with families anyway. So using people that are directly engaging with families is the best way, in some ways, of raising their awareness of their eligibility and making them aware of these important services which are eligible for. Eligible for. So there's a, a role there for staff working in the community to act as uh, the communicator of eligibility and make sure that people are, are, are taking up the services which they're, they're being tasked to in the early early in funding. There's a broader point, though, I think, that we wanted to make, which is um, clearly this issue of strategic planning is very important for local authorities. And we made the point in the report that local authorities need to get better at developing proper strategic commissioning plans for the services they need to deliver the expansion. That should involve engaging with communities as well and understanding the needs of families and parents, which will hopefully help to inform the, the, the appropriateness of the targeting of the resources that are being invested for the future. Yeah, I, I take what you say, but that given some of the complexities around the, the welfare system, there still has to be that information from the DWP to the local authorities and to the, the, the government to make sure that the health visitors are given the right information to the right people, surely. Key for eligible two-year-olds. Yes, um, yeah, that, because it's, that's primarily it's that what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for three- and four-year-olds, the entitlement's universal, so yeah. it's much more about all health visitors, um, GP practices, all knowing um, what the entitlements are and being able to point parents in the right direction. Um, and our work showed that makes a big difference to parents' take-up. Thank you. Thank uh, you. George, then Oliver. Morning. Uh, I'm sorry to labour the point over data, and it's a question I seem to be asking in every committee I seem to be on. Is, uh, is it the situation with data? You're saying that those eligible uh, local authorities don't know uh, who they all are. Now, is it because there's a problem? I think Liz kind of mentioned this as well, but is it because there's a problem accessing that data? It is there, 
but there's a problem accessing it, whether it be process or legality or whatever, you know, is that the process, is that the problem, or is it the fact it's just not there at all? It is there. The, key, the team will keep me right. Um, the key problem um, in terms of councils knowing who's eligible is around two-year-old children. Um, and the estimate is that about 25% of two-year-olds are eligible, either because their parents receive certain benefits or because they're looked after children. So councils won't automatically know who those children are without information from HMRC and DWP. Um, the information is held by those two agencies, but it's not shared with councils at the moment. Um, okay, and, and there's no statutory duty on councils to hold that data themselves, so they have to negotiate with HMRC and DWP about access, and we understand that's underway. Okay, then. The other stuff uh, I was wanting to ask about was, it was interesting to hear about uh, the difference between the figures between Scottish Government and uh, uh, local government. Now, this is a two-pointed question, obviously. The HQ staff that was taken into account, is that HQ staff that are currently still in, uh, are there at local government as we speak, admin staff and central staff? And uh, the other part would be, uh, in your opinion, is this maybe just the case of having been a local councillor myself, uh, the usual dance that Scottish Government and uh, local government do, where they're effectively they're negotiating at this point to try and see how they deliver the service? Um, I'll, I'll start off with the second of your points. I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't an, ele an element of negotiation here on the numbers of staff and the costs involved. Um, that's routine, um, but the gap is quite significant in this point, and we understand some of the reasons why it's there, because of the different approaches that government and councils have taken to modelling and estimating that, so that gap does need to close. Um, I've forgotten what your first question was, I'm sorry. Uh, HQ staff, are oh, they yes. currently already but These in are the central. additional admin staff that councils think they need to administer um, the expansion to 1140 hours, which... Yeah, to what's there. Right. So, so basically we could be talking about it could be part of the negotiation between the two to try and... Because there's always a difference between local government and national government about delivery uh, because of... Someone's at the front line, someone's uh, looking from afar. So uh, there's, there's still work be to done between the two to actually get to that stage. So we're at the early stages at this point. Yeah, as I said in my response to the convener's opening question, I think we're not so much surprised that there is a gap. Um, we're um, noting the size of the gap and the fact that actually some of it is, is because the councils didn't have the guidance they needed on things like flexibility, quality standards and how funding will follow the child in future. And that means that it's taking longer to close the gap while the, top, the clock is ticking towards 2020. Okay. Probably a good time to remind people that we need to keep our questions short as we've got uh, an early start today. Uh, not because you're coming up, Oliver, but because of the last question. <laughs> Oliver. I, I believe you, convener. Um, I wondered if there was a sort of detailed breakdown of the difference between the Scottish Government and Council's figures. I know you mentioned that admin staff make up some of it, but do you have a detailed breakdown? Uh, we might be able to give you something on that. Um, yeah, I can give you what you got. You might be better to also ask the government because I think the picture is moving all the time. They, we know that the councils have just been changing their figures recently and submitting that to the government, so they might be able to give you a more up-to-date picture of the difference. Okay, no, that's, helpful. that's helpful. I also just wondered, just as in, in terms of clarification, you feel even on the, the government's more optimistic figures that it would be very difficult to recruit that number of staff in the timescale, is that correct? Our concerns are twofold, I think. One, yes, it will be difficult to recruit that number of staff and have them trained to the, the quality standards required by August 2020. And alongside that, the investment in infrastructure is significant. Both sides recognise it's significant, whatever the exact m number, and everybody will be looking to have that in place over the same short period of time, um, which is why we concluded it would be difficult to achieve the expansion by August 2020 now. Um, one of the concerns I've had uh, locally in my own constituency is that uh, as uh, the local authority expand their nursery provision, you know, a number of their staff are likely to come uh, from existing private and voluntary uh, providers. Um, and I just wondered whether that was something that you'd uh, looked at, because um, obviously that would have a significant effect on provision, particularly in smaller rural communities. We know it's a concern. Rebecca, Tricia, one of you like to pick it up? Partner providers have certainly raised that as a, a concern to us when we've spoken to them, that it's 
hard for them to recruit in the first place and that they are losing staff to um, sit area to council provision where they're essentially getting better terms and conditions. That's definitely been a risk they've raised. Because um, within uh, Dumfries and Galway at present, um, all uh, private providers have asked for a halt to uh, the procurement process because they're worried they can't deliver uh, what's been asked of them at the, at the, at the cost uh, the council's willing to pay. Um, and that could result in around 2,000 places uh, being lost if, if, if some of those start to, to fold. And I just wondered, uh, in, terms of, in, in terms of that uh, payment per place, whether, again, that was something uh, that you'd looked at. In the, in the report in paragraph 102, where we, we make reference to the National Deliveries Association survey, where providers talk about the differential rate that they charge parents as opposed to the, the fee that they receive from local authorities, and they do highlight it at risk as part of the expansion moving forward. And have, yeah, sorry, have you looked at all at a, a, a sort of more standardised national uh, rate across different uh, local authorities? Because that's one of the other uh, concerns I've had repeatedly is that different local authorities are, have, have used different modelling uh, and have a different funding package for uh, third party providers? We, we didn't look specifically at that as part of the audit and um, the introduction of a national policy would be a policy matter rather than an audit matter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. Briefly on, on that question, I wonder if there's evidence that local authorities calculate the cost of a public provided place as X but will offer Y to external providers, so that they're, so that they're you know, driving out costs out into private and third sector. I don't know if that's true, but I wondered if that is something you've looked at. We didn't look at the unit cost calculation for local authority provision or private or third sector provision as part of the audit. It's certainly an interesting question, but it wasn't part of the audit work that we did. And, and, although I think we're back to the Scottish government did produce a financial review that looked at um, that difference, and it looked the the cost of. Um, council provision comes out on average at £5.45 an hour and I think what councils are paying to partner providers on average is £3.70. There's kind of differences in the way that they had to calculate those rates so the £5.45 for councils is for three and four year olds um, whereas the partner provider figure is um, for zero to fours. Councils pay 3.59 to partner providers, sorry, and the 3.70 is how much partner providers are saying it costs them. Councils also identified about 99 pence an hour as a cost to them of commissioning a partner provider place. That's not the cost that goes to the partner provider, it's another cost that they incur. So zero to four you would imagine would cost more because the, the, the ratios are different the, the younger the child is, but they're offering less money. But I suppose it reflects the financial pressures on local authorities as well. Can I ask, though, around this question of admin staff? Because I think people can say, oh, well, admin staff, what do they do? We don't need to count them in the calculation. I want to get a sense of what that might actually be. Has there been any work done to look at the support staff that would be inside a nursery if you were going to be delivering for all children, and specifically children with special needs, and whether some of that calculation has been brought into play around what might be deemed to be um, admin support might actually be the support that allows a young person to access a nursery place. Minute, but I think the figure that she referred to, um, which is in the council's estimates and not in the government's, is the staff that councils need centrally within the council to receive applications from parents of eligible two, three and four year olds and then match them with um, a place that meets their needs as closely as possible, rather than staff in the nurseries themselves doing administration. Fair to see that the more places that have to be administered and the more hours that have to be administered, it would be reasonable to expect while there might be there might be some economies of scale. There still would be cost associated with that. Is that right? Absolutely. I think, and again, that will differ from council to council depending on what they're starting with and how many children they need to cover when we get to 11:40. I want to maybe say a bit more about the issue around the nature of the young people who are coming in. But um, one of the, the, the uh, submissions we received from Fair Funding for Our Kids says that the Care Inspectorate reports a third of three to four year olds are not receiving a funded place. Is it your understanding that the calculations by the government in simply saying this is what we give 
and therefore if we had more it would be more, is it taking into account this deficit in actual access to plays? I mean, 20 years ago I didn't access a funded place because the hours were ridiculous and no use to somebody who was in full-time work and I thought that maybe things had moved on. But do you think that the local authority, cal the, sorry, the government calculation is on the number of children who are in the system bulked up or is it acknowledging there's actually a space there where there is an, there's, there's theoretically a right but it's not been accessed? Rebecca, to come in in a moment, there's two complications there, and I'm sorry this is complicated. The first is, as we say in the report, calculating how many children are eligible is difficult, um, and the data are about registrations, not children, so there's a, there's a bit of complexity there which links back to the fair funding for our children figures. Um, and secondly, we know that the government and councils have made different assumptions about the uptake of eligibility, which is part of the difference between them. Rebecca, do you want to put some flesh on that? Yeah, I think the, the specific figure around for the care inspector, about the third not getting their, their place, those were trial statistics that the care inspector only published in one year. Um, and I think the reason they labelled them as trial statistics was there was a lot of issues around the data quality. Um, they haven't published them again since the figures that the, the census figures we believe, although there are issues around the quality of that, are probably the more reliable figure in terms of what's available at the moment, um, looking at uptake. I think what everyone is doing to base their projections for 1140 is looking at the population rather than looking at how many people are currently taking up their places. So for three and four year olds, they know that um, the projected population is what they will be basing their figures on, albeit with different assumptions around what the uptake may or may not be. Would they be looking, though, at the, you know, the special needs of children? Because if there, if there was a, a system which it, your, the, the needs of your child couldn't be met within the particular local authority <coughs> place or whatever, and we know anecdotally it's much more difficult, but that might distort the figures. It would certainly distort the figures around cost because if you're effective at getting young people with special needs into a nursery setting, you're going to have to acknowledge that there's going to be support needs that will go alongside that. And I wonder if there's any evidence that that work has been done at all. Because one would see, surely hope that in expanding the hours, those young people who are currently... I wouldn't say routinely excluded, but are more difficult to get access a place would be accommodated. So we know this is I think this is something that's ongoing at the moment. In the Scottish Government's evaluation report, when they, um, they did a survey of about 10,500 parents, um, and they looked at additional support needs as part of that, and they found that 17% of parents who had eligible children with additional support needs were dissatisfied with their access to suitable early learning and childcare. And about half of parents who had eligible children with additional support needs had one or more difficulty in accessing suitable provision. Um, I think there's an ELC inclusion fund of £2 million, which is to help staff support children with additional support needs. And that's to fund specialist training for staff in ELC, as well as funding for equipment. I think they've got to the stage of appointing a partner to administer that fund, but it's not yet open for applications. But that's something that's in the pipeline. And so the £2 million presumably will have to be bulked up. If you're, if you're increasing from eligible hours 600 to 1140, £2 million is not going to be sufficient. That's what the current figure is that we have. <coughs> OK, thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Ross, and then finish off with Claire. Thanks, convener. The difference between the government's figures and the council's figures is proportionately the most striking when it comes to infrastructure. I was wondering if you'd be able to expand a little bit on just how dramatic a, a difference occurred there. It's the biggest difference, and I think it comes down again to the different approaches to modelling that the two parties have had. Rebecca, can you say a bit more about it? Or Tricia? <coughs> <coughs> so the, the guidance from the Scottish Government around um, infrastructure was that that council should make the best use of their assets first. So they, they had a kind of an ordering, so make best use of what you've got already. So things like expanding um, hours using beyond the school hour into school holidays, etc. So to do that first and um, to look at availability of partner providers, working with partner providers and that the final kind of um, options should be to actually be building new infrastructure. 
it's not very clear from the council's plans whether or not they've taken, they've all taken that approach or not. And do you understand that's part of the discussions that are going on again between councils and Scottish Government as they look at revising the plans? But I think, but whatever way you look at it, there's still a significant amount of additional infrastructure required over a short time period. Absolutely, and I think that the issue of the short time period is going to be a particularly acute one. The council's estimate over 400, the government's overall um, figure is 400 million. The council's estimate more than 400 million for entirely new infrastructure alone. Is there any breakdown of that, for example, how much of that 400 million is the cost of purchasing land versus the cost of constructing on land that councils already own? Not that I'm aware of. We've got a figure of 411 for new builds, but I don't know the breakdown between land or... Grant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. opening remarks, I'm afraid, going right back to the start. Um, when you talked about um, the government um, being unclear about what the outcome priorities were, and, and you said that if it was following the child, it would be quality. If it was following the um, parents, it would be flexibility. I, I'm really at a loss to see why those should be two competing and disparate priorities and outcomes. So um, what's the evidential work that's been done on quality? And it is what you're saying inevitably that flexibility reduces quality? I think what we're saying is that, um, first of all, um, everybody agrees, I think, that an outcomes-based approach is a good thing, um, and that the, the two outcomes of improving <coughs> outcomes for children and helping parents into work, training and study are both worthwhile outcomes. Um, the number of childcare hours isn't an outcome, it's an output, although it's one that many parents welcome. Um, I think the clearest way to put it is that if you are looking to improve um, outcomes for, for children, the evidence um, doesn't suggest that providing extra hours for children who are already receiving childcare does very much to improve outcomes for children. The evidence is much stronger that starting um, access to early learning and childcare earlier does improve outcomes. Um, and if that was the government's priority outcome, then rather than making 600 hours available for all, all children, we think they should have considered, at the least, whether they could have had more of that outcome by uh, providing fewer hours for all children from the age of two, or taking the most disadvantaged children and giving them additional hours from the age of two onwards. Um, so it's not so much that um, quality and flexibility are in competition, but um, the, w the outcome you're trying to achieve um, affects the way in which you invest the money that you're putting in, and it is significant investment in this policy for very good reasons. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on that note, then, we will finish this session. Can I thank you, Auditor-General, and your colleagues for your attendance today? Uh, I understand the Minister has been watching this session in her ministerial office, and so we will now suspend for a couple of minutes to await the Minister. Thank you very much.
is the last in our series of Ask the Minister evidence sessions. Today we will hear from the Minister for Child Care and Early Years with a focus on two themes, early learning and child care and then care experienced young people. And can I welcome Marie Todd, Minister for Child Care and Early Years, Michael Chalmers, Director for Children and Families, Joel Griffin, Deputy Director, Creating Positive Futures Division, and Donald Henderson, Deputy Director for Care, Protection and Justice. And can I invite the Minister, if she wishes, to make a brief opening statement? Thank you, Convener. I'm tempted to say you saved the best till last week. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you. It's been a great privilege for me to serve as Minister for Childcare in early years since my appointment last November. This is particularly so given the priority that this government places on early years, a, a preventative approach, and ensuring that every child and young person has the same opportunity to prosper in life. Too many of our children and young people, through no fault of their own, do not start with the life chances to which they're entitled. I understand that the committee wishes to focus on its questions today on two key areas of policy, early learning and childcare and on looked after children. These policy areas sit at the heart of our ambitious programme to transform outcomes for our children and young people. The evidence tells us that support in the early years is where we can make the biggest positive impact on outcomes for children. And that's where we focused our investment uh, with our investment in early learning and childcare. Given the critical importance of this programme, I recognise and very much welcome the important role of this committee and indeed the um, Audit Scotland in scrutinising the government's approach. Let me be clear from the outset about Audit, the Audit Scotland report. I and my ministerial colleagues agree that the expansion to 1140 hours of early learning and childcare is hugely ambitious. Where we perhaps depart from some of our reporting on this issue is that we think it's our job, indeed our duty, to be hugely ambitious. To give just one example, recruiting the numbers of people we need to the workforce in its, is in itself a considerable challenge albeit one which will provide opportunities for good quality jobs and careers for people in every community in this country. However, I am confident that we are on track, not least because of the strong partnership that we have with local government and with other key players. I agree that challenges and indeed difficult challenges remain, but I am determined that we will succeed because the prize is so great. It's an opportunity to give children the best ch start in life and to transform their life chances. We also have a responsibility as a government and as a country to improve the life chances of young people in the care system who depend on us to ensure that they can have the safe, fulfilling and loving childhood to which they are entitled. Too often as a country, we have let these young people down and it's for that reason that Fiona Duncan was asked to lead the root and branch review of care, which is being shaped, of course, by the voice of care experienced young people themselves. We will engage with the recommendations of the review as they emerge, and I'm determined that, the si that we seize this opportunity to transform the life chances of our looked after children. Convener, I welcome the opportunity to engage with the committee today on these two policy areas, which are so important to the government's fundamental commitment to the country's children and young people. I'm very happy to be here to explore these issues further, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, as you're aware, the committee invited suggestions and submissions from stakeholders and the public for today's session. Can I thank everyone who's contributed? We will ask questions in person today, and anything that is not asked now will be sent to the Minister for a formal response to the committee. All responses will be shared with those that asked the questions. And, and before I invite questions from members of the committee on childcare, I'd like to start by asking the Minister, you've seen that we were speaking to the Auditor General there, what action the government has taken so far in response to the Audit Scotland report, and what steps it plans to, to undertake in the future? So we remain on track to deliver 1140 hours, um, the expansion that we intend to deliver in funded high quality early learning and child care. Our expansion programme is absolutely ambitious and it will be challenging to deliver, but we are working really hard with local authorities and other delivery partners to ensure that we create the workforce and the physical capacity required. 
um, it's absolutely crucial to the, that delivery that we reach agreement on the multi-year funding package to support the expansion by the end of April, and we're on track to do that. We're making really good progress in reaching a shared understanding of the revenue and capital costs of the expansion, following updates to the local authority cost estimates, so I'm really confident that we are going to reach an agreement soon. The Deputy First Minister and myself will meet with COSLA leaders next week on Thursday, 29th March, to progress the funding discussions. Uh, there seem to be, in, in the Audit Scotland report, there, there's lots of talks about a big gap between the Scottish Government and local authorities. And uh, <coughs> Are you confident that that gap is going to be closed in terms of um, the, 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 the cost, the flexibility and the quality that uh, is desired from this project? Absolutely confident. I think it's wrong probably to speak about a funding gap. Um, we are committed to funding this policy in full, and I've said that repeatedly. Um, it's right that we take the time to assure ourselves over the robustness of these estimates and that we're collectively making best use of public funds um, through this, I mean, frankly, significant investment. So the Audit Scotland report presented two sets of estimates on the um, revenue costs arising from the expansion, one prepared by ourselves, by Scottish Government, and one prepared by local authorities. Um, as you heard, Audit Scotland didn't particularly analyse either set of estimates. They didn't interrogate the figures. They just identified that there was this difference. We're working very hard with COSLA and local authorities to reach a shared understanding of the costs. And you heard from the Auditor General some of the um, areas that, where there were different assumptions underlying. And um, we have a joint finance working group working very hard on that. The local authorities submitted their updated financial estimates to us in March, um, and that will inform the political discussions next week on the multi-year funding. OK, thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Just following on from that, Audit Scotland suggested there had been uh, some significant movement. Um, do you have any breakdown uh, on what the, what the gap in terms of staffing levels or in terms of funding is now? I think um, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to negotiate this in public and you wouldn't expect me to. Let's place it. Um, so at the moment, we're at a crucial point in these negotiations, but I can assure you that we are working together well and we are working towards a shared understanding of what's required. So does that mean the government has increased its offer or has all of the movement been on the local authority side? As I said, I'm not going to negotiate this in public. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, my own constituency, I, I'm grateful to you for agreeing uh, to meet with some private providers, uh, but there's been a lot of concern. They talk of a crisis and have asked for procurement uh, to, to, to be paused uh, because they're worried uh, that uh, they won't be able to deliver uh, around the, the 2,000 places they currently provide uh, and are worried um, that they, they won't have a part to play in the expansion of the 11.40 hours uh, at present. They're worried about losing staff uh, to the Council's expansion um, and they're worried um, as well about uh, the phasing uh, that Dumfries and Galway Council have proposed uh, that means that parents will be able to move uh, their children to different nurseries in different parts of the region that will get the 11.40 hours first. Uh, and they're also uh, worried um, and feel there's a great unfairness that they're currently having to cross-subsidise uh, nursery places and that uh, hard-working families um, are having to pay out of their own pocket to, to pick up the shortfall. Um, do you have any comment on that? Firstly, I'm really looking forward to meeting with you and these partners. Um, one of the um, things that I'm most pleased with is how closely we are working with so many different people on the ground. We are absolutely clear that partner providers will be part of the picture going forward. We don't think that we're going to be able to deliver the quality and the flexibility that we require without having private nurseries, third sector nurseries and childminders as part of the package going forward. So from a government's perspective, we've, we are developing a provider on new provider neutral model and we are absolutely sure that these people should be part of our offering going forward. Um, in terms of um, phasing, the reason that we're phasing um, the way that we are is because we want this 
policy and this increase in hours to benefit the people who need it most first. So we have asked local authorities to go first to the areas where there is the greatest level of need. Um, and I don't think anyone around this table would disagree with that. I think that's the right thing to do. We're not going to go overnight from 600 to 1140 hours. It is going to be a phased transition. And I think it's absolutely right that we um, phase and target initially the areas that need it most. In terms of staff, I understand that there is an issue with um, private nursery staff um, being more lucratively employed in local authorities, and we're working very hard to change that situation. You'll understand that part of our offering and part of what we've agreed to fully fund is a living, you know, it, it should enable nurseries to pay the living wage. We think that's absolutely, that again, at the heart of um, ensuring quality we want the staff to be have good quality jobs um, so the living wages uh, you know we're, that's why we're giving extra money to local authorities so that they can increase their offering to private nurseries and make sure that people are paid a good wage um, in terms of the cross subsidy again um, we're determined, I mean, we're not going to set a national rate or anything, but we're determined to iron out some of the differences in procurement across the, the nation because we think that the procurement um, steps to um, gain, um, at, you know, to become a funded provider are, you know, there's quite a lot of barriers in the place of these businesses at times. We want to simplify that process and say so that once you've passed the national standard, you have passed the national standard. So we're trying hard to simplify that. We don't want to lose any of the quality on the way, um, but we are absolutely, let me assure you, we are keen that um, other people than local authorities, so partner providers such as private nurseries, such as third sector nurseries, and definitely childminders continue to operate in this sector. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, but the other thing I would like to ask about is the staffing numbers and whether you think it's realistic that we're going to even find uh, 6,000 new staff on time. Because again, uh, within uh, Dumfries and Galloway, I know that they're struggling to recruit enough staff to meet current provision. And I've heard uh, from head teachers in some local authority nurseries uh, that they're having to take time uh, out of uh, running uh, not just the nursery, but the primary school to actually help out um, in order to fill uh, gaps. Um, do you think that it's realistic across the country as a whole uh, that we're going to find that number of people on time? Yes, although I absolutely acknowledge the level of challenge involved. I mean, I heard somebody, I went to one of the road shows that they're doing in a school and, and it was described as the biggest recruitment drive since the Second World War. It is huge. The scale of the ambition of this is, is incredible, but it will be transformative. As I said, the prize will be worth having. Um, we are putting robust measures in place to ensure that we have sufficient capacity. We are supporting new entrants to the sector to gain the qualifications that we need, they need. Um, and we're attracting more people into jobs in early learning and childcare in that there's um, career and progression pathways right into the section. The expansion of the ELC workforce is already underway, um, so it's not that nothing's happened. Um, to support the first phase of the workforce expansion in 2017-18, we already provided local authorities with 21 million additional revenue funding, increased the ELC-related capacity in colleges and universities, and increased ELC modern apprenticeships by 10%. We estimate that the combined effects of this investment will have supported between two and 3,000 additional placements to enter the ELC workforce already, so those people are already in place. We launched phase one of our national recruitment campaign um, last year in October 2017. Probably none of us, well, maybe Ross Greer has seen it, but it was very targeted at, at young people. Um, so many of us won't have, won't have seen um, this campaign, um, but it was very successful at attracting people to our website. So it was targeted at school leaders. Um, it's a bit too early to be absolutely sure of the impact of it, but we're pleased with the increase in traffic to the website that we've had. And we think, um, that it will result in extra recruitment. Phase two of the recruitment campaign um, is coming in, in the next few months and will be targeting returning parents and career changers. And with that phase, we're also hoping to increase the diversity of the workforce. Thank you. Okay, uh, Joanne. Um, 
Thank you very much. I should say that we have received a lot of very helpful submissions and want to thank all of those that took the time to um, provide us with information for this session. But, um, and I wanted just to focus on one submission, which is uh, fair funding for our kids, who basically describe the current situation for families trying to access childcare. So it's not about aspiration, everybody can share aspiration, but the reality of, of people's experience currently. Um, that most councils only offer free childcare for half days. Two thirds of all nursery places in Scotland are for half days. Just one in ten council nurseries are open between 8 and 6 pm or longer. Um, 19 councils have no nurseries which are open between 8 and 6 pm. Um, and a whole number of other factors which suggest there's a pretty major problem with the current situation. What work are you doing to address that? Because it may be in the future as an expansion of um, eligibility to ours, but what that seemed to describe is actually it's very difficult for families to access the support and the places that they need, childcare places that they need um, for their families. So really, that's a reason to expand the uh, eligible hours. So the re well, you know, one of the main reasons that we're doubling the hours is because that will make a significant difference when, parent, when families are able to access m more hours, there won't be the same um, difficulty. So I, I can see, as a parent myself, that for some families, gaining three hours of funded access to childcare in an afternoon in a local authority setting may not be transformative. But actually gaining something near a school day um, and having some flexibility around where that is delivered will absolutely be transformative. So the concerns that they are raising are why we are changing things going forward. Making is the current eligibility 600 hours. What has been described there is people not being able to access those hours because they're not available in a setting that suits them. There's no logical connection between expanding the number of hours and making it more accessible. And I'm interested in how you think you would ad address this question. So if most nurseries only offer free childcare places for half days, if you expand that to offer more half days, but don't necessarily make it more likely for families <laughs> to access whole days or longer periods of days, then they're not going to be able to use um, the, 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 the the facilities are there now. You maybe have heard when I asked um, the Auditor Scotland and our staff about the Cairn Spectre um, report on a third of third to three to four year olds not receiving a funded place. I'm not sure if that's true. What is your estimate of the number of places that young people are entitled to or families are entitled and not taken up? So I think I heard I heard that um, discussion um, with the Auditor General and her team, and I understood from what she said that the the um, the figure of a third was from a data collection. Yes. So I think our census is correct. So Which I think is? that so near a hundred percent of three places for three and four year olds are taken up. Um, that would be my yes. understanding. Um, I suppose uh, you, uh, I'm interested in this expansion hours and we can maybe have a further conversation about how you secure what's already there before you expand it, whether the, you balance one off against the other. I wonder if you think there's an issue about you're expanding free care places, but there is evidence currently of local authorities increasing the cost of childcare um, for the paid places. So, for example, in Glasgow, there's a 50% increase in childcare costs, just been brought in without consultation to families. I wonder if you have a view on that decision and whether that cuts across a policy which says that childcare is central to our young people. So, what we are aiming to do is increase childcare. That will naturally, and I, I, I can see that I'm failing to get this point across to you, but naturally that will increase flexibility because it is a huge increase we are talking about moving from a half day each day to a whole day virtually the same as a primary school day either families well so that's twice. that's the aim for for this policy and that naturally will provide more flexibility in addition to that 
We have local authorities go out on a regular basis. It's a statutory requirement for them to go out and consult with their local populations as to what is required to meet their needs. And I believe that local authorities have a good understanding of supply and demand in their, state, in their areas. Um, the recent, most recent Care Inspectorate report, so 19th September 2018, showed that flexibility is improving. Um, more than half of providers, 51.4% of providers, are now offering a choice of provision. The proportion of council settings providing funded ELC before, during and after school has increased from 19% in 2013 up to 30% in 2016. The proportion of council settings operating during school holidays has increased from 18% to 23%. I agree we're not where we want to be yet, but we are moving in the, in the right direction. And I think the increase in funded hours will transform this landscape. So do you have a view on the increased on non-funded hours from by 50% without consultation with parents? Is that not going against a policy which I would support, which is recognised the fundamental importance of childcare and the benefits of funded places by government? Is increasing fund the charged amount by 50% in, in line with government policy, or do you think it goes against that policy? So, as I understand it, the increase in Glasgow is still um, very fairly priced compared to alternatives. There are exemptions for families on low income, and um, it's for local authorities, as I'm sure you'll understand. To it's reasonable. for local authorities to make decisions on these issues, not for central government. Thank you. Can I come in on two points? One is the Glasgow point is that the Glasgow raised the threshold to 30,000 uh, for eligibility. So those that are, that are earning less than that, there's more of them uh, more benefiting from eligibility. Uh, except the point that, that is made by Joanne about the, the increase for, for those that are earning over 30,000, but it's obviously to help fund that. But more importantly, I think from the point, that, the, the very important point that Joanne raised, uh, if, if Local authorities are at this stage giving an inflexible model. Can we be assured that when we get to the end of this process, that that inflexible model, no matter if it's sort of like half days or a full day within a very set time, which doesn't work for many parents, will, will no longer be there? So at the moment, we are absolutely focused on delivering this expansion. So moving from 600 hours of funded entitlement to 1140 hours of funded entitlement for all three and four year olds and for eligible two year olds. As you'll understand, that is our primary focus at the moment. In 2020, we are hoping to look at introducing a um, funding follows the child model, which I am sure will solve some of these flex flexibility issues. At the moment, we have a consultation out on what that might look like. We've got um, consultations on a national standard. It will be underpinned by a national standard. I think that will solve many of these problems, as well as, and uh, you know, I, I agree, I am failing to get this point across, but increasing the hours, doubling the hours, is going to make them um, it, it more useful to parents, undoubtedly. OK, okay. thank you, Minister. Uh, Ruth, then Mary. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, I'd like to ask you about um, Childminder's role in um, the delivery. We have a submission from um, the Childminder's uh, organisation who tell us that um, 10 out of the 14 um, ELC trials did involve childminding, but um, they felt that in some cases that was based on a lack of nursery availability rather than parental choice and um, flexibility. And I suppose I'm interested to hear your thoughts on where childminders um, fit into this and perhaps um, the role that they can play in providing that um, care in a home setting and in smaller numbers and how that may actually benefit a number of, of, of our children that are using them. Absolutely. So I see that, um, you know, childminders are a great option for um, some families, for younger children, for um, children that are going to, you know, where they're part of a family that some children are going to school as well. I absolutely agree with the, the concept of families being able to choose the type of childcare that suits their needs and childminders will be a part of that going forward. 
one of the reasons that we include child minding in the trials is because we're determined that, that should be, um, they should be an important part of things going forward. And I'm meeting, in fact, today, I think later today after this, with um, Maggie Simpson, who's the chief executive of um, SCMA, to discuss further how we can ensure that they are comfortable with where things are going. Central government's view is that um, we, are, we are provider neutral. We want this expansion to happen. We're not saying um, who should be providing the care. What we are saying is that we want it to happen. Um, we've engaged extensively with stakeholders, including childminders. I think that, again, I'll go back to this funding follows the child. I think that's what will solve many of the problems in this area, or the perceived problems or the perceived barriers. Um, it will be, that will make it provider neutral. As long as somebody, as long as the provider meets the national standard, they'll be eligible to become a funded partner. Um, and we are also quite keen to simplify the procurement process so that it's not quite so burdensome, so that it's a bit more proportionate for childminders who may only have a small number of children. And, and if they're unlucky enough, those children might come from different local authority areas. Um, so we're really very keen to engage with them. We see them as a very valuable part of the offering going forward. And we're keen to smooth out these um, barriers that they're facing currently in future. Thank you. At the end of, of the submission, Maggie Simpson makes quite a strong statement that the future of childminding is under threat if, if they're not included fully and properly. Um, I mean, you've given a, a sort of flavour of some of the things that can be done, but what, what else can... How can we ensure that local authorities and that the, the things that the Commission, that they are included properly as partners? Um, uh... We are determined, you know, central government, we see this fair funding, funding following our child, funding following our child model will make it provider neutral. So the families themselves will be able to choose the type of childcare that suits their family needs most. I am sure that families will continue to use childminders in some cases because that will be what suits their needs best. Um, we will work, you know, as I say, I'm meeting with Maggie Simpson later today. I'm all ears to hear what problems that she has and what barriers she wants to raise with me and I'm more than happy to take those on and work on them together with her to ensure that we deliver um, this with childminders at the heart of it as well. Thank you. Um, Mary and then Ross. And then Thank Liz. you, um, convener. I wanted to come back to the, the workforce um, issue that um, Oliver Mundell w was asking you about um, just very briefly. Um, no, I did. I did, oh, but I'm you didn't sorry, let I'm me in. I'm sorry. I'm I was trying that. very patiently to get in. Um, Audit Scotland, as you know, I've said that the Scottish Government have not yet done enough to ensure that the staff um, will be in place in time to deliver the increase in hours. You'll know that the local authorities estimate that 12,000 staff are, are needed and the Scottish Government figures estimate at 8,000. Now, you, you spoke very um, fully when you gave your answer to Oliver Mundell about what's been done to um, recruit additional staff. How many additional staff have you recruited? Between two and three thousand. Between two and... So, uh, Already in place. So how, how many staff are in place to deliver this now? Between two and three thousand. How many staff in total are in place? I can't give you that figure. We'll have to write to you. So we've, there's been an extra two and three thousand started training this year. Between an extra two and three thousand. I can't give you the figure of the current number of staff. So how, can, how near the... That number? No. So how near the 12,000 are they? So between two and 3,000 is what? Quarter but you don't, know how, how you, you, you don't have a figure for the number of, of, of staff you had before you increased it to, by so two or 3,000, no? Yeah, I'll if send you, don't you the have figures. It, you don't have. We'll answer that. Uh -huh. if, you, if you could give us the figures, that, that would be um, very, very um, welcome. Um, and just before I, I come on to the, the issue of, of child minding, um, I want to be really clear, the increase in the provision, is it to improve educational outcomes for children or is it for the benefit of the parents? Because I'm confused because you've spoken about both. What is the primary focus of, of, of this, the primary intention? The primary intention is to improve the quality 
of educational offering for children. We are determined to close the attainment gap, which is already apparent at age three. We are determined to put in place early years education, which narrows that gap before the children reach school. As your panel, your committee member Claire Adamson pointed out, though, I don't believe it has to be a binary choice. It's not an either or. We can do more than one thing at a time. We are absolutely determined to increase the quality of early years education, but we are also determined to increase the flexibility for families. If we can, as well as improving the educational offering, if we can also improve the family income by reducing childcare costs or by freeing parents up to go to education or to uh, work longer hours, then we'll improve the family income as well, and that will make a, a huge difference to the individual child. So improving outcomes, you'll need, you, you need to encourage more children to come into the system to help Absolutely. to improve the outcomes. Can I come on to the issue of, of child minders then? Um, child minders are a, a very valuable asset. And if, if the aim is to improve outcomes for children, how will you assess the educational outcomes um, from children that are based with childminders? How will you make sure they're on a par with nurseries? So at the moment, childminders are regulated, are regulated and care inspected. Um, so their outcomes for childminders, for children going through childminders are Specifically educational very good. outcomes in reducing the attainment gap. How will you ensure that childminders help to reduce the attainment gap? So, 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 so um, there are two points that we are looking at. The first is whether, in a consultation we'll be having shortly on the national standard to underpin the funding follows a child, it is reasonable to expect that childminders would be qualified. At the moment, many childminders are qualified, but it's not currently a requirement. So we'd like to put in the consultation the question about whether it's reasonable to expect a qualification of that kind. So that would be one thing. The second aspect then is looking at a much more integrated inspection regime between Care Inspectorate and Education Scotland. So there's more seamless understanding of the quality of the provision provided in all the different settings, both on the education, the learning side and the childcare side. So if you currently have childminders that are not qualified and you decide that there is a, a requirement that they should be qualified, if not all childminders want to go through that process, you may lose childminders. Can I be very clear that it won't be simply us that make that decision on whether childminders should be qualified? We are very keen to have, um, we're putting that out for consultation at the moment, and we're keen to have childminders themselves state whether they think it's an appropriate thing to ask them to be qualified or not. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Joanne, you wanted to come yeah, in very briefly. I wanted to ask her just... Uh, an interesting point in this thing about the attainment gap because I mean I think probably it would be fair to say in terms of government's thinking the expand hours there's going to be improvement for young for children improvement for families that's something that I absolutely accepted but I was very struck by the Auditor General's argument which says with the same pot of money you could actually direct the money in, a, in another way particularly around the way the gap grows by the time a child is three and the suggestion was that the government hadn't done any work around looking at, instead of giving everybody extra hours from three and four, so longer hours, actually investing on vulnerable younger children where that gap emerges. And I wonder if you, reflecting on that, are, are you, oh, have you reflected on the Auditor General's suggestion that you should have done that? Would you look at that, that actually there's that very strong argument for saying in terms of the attainment gap in particular, you direct resources to two-year-olds, particularly um, youngsters who are already disadvantaged by the time they get to two. What I would say is, isn't that exactly what we are doing? So we have expanded the entitlement to all three and four-year-olds. We have a universal offering, but we are targeting it at eligible two-year-olds as well. So we are already doing both. We are determined to close that attainment I gap. think the suggestion from the Auditor General is, rather than expanding it, you could have put even more resource into two-year-olds and given the challenges of identifying vulnerable two-year-olds actually by maybe making it a general offer to all two-year-olds you're going to pull in lots of youngsters who are already disadvantaged and this one I'm, I'm, it's not something until i read it in the auditor general's report that i'd properly thought through but there is a logic to that argument and i wonder whether it's something you would look at further 
So certainly, I mean, we are very, you know, we are absolutely determined to close this attainment gap. So we are very keen to target two-year-olds and we're very keen to target eligible two-year-olds. Um, we are doing work around that. I'm not sure if there's, um, we'll, you know, we'll maybe come on to that later in evidence about how to, to how to identify these two-year-olds and how to get them in. Interrupt you, but do you know why they didn't? That wasn't tested by government. That option of saying we'll include all two-year-olds in the 600 hours, rather than using the money to expand. To, I'm not sure if I have a view one way or another which is the better, but I wonder if there was any. Or if you know why there so, wasn't some so evidence-based work can on I why just that was done. Clarify what you're putting to me. So what you're saying is, should the government have looked at not expanding childcare for three and four-year-olds, and making the 600 hours universal for two-year-olds, mm -hmm. versus increasing the offering to 1140 hours for all eligible two-year-olds plus all three and four-year-olds? Well, to be fair, it's not my proposition. I've okay. said already that I kind of thought that that made sense. But what the Auditor General is saying is actually in terms of outcomes, there was another way of doing this, which was to say there's an issue about uptake for vulnerable two-year-olds. We're not capturing them in sufficient numbers. Should we have invested, before expanding ours, invest it, if it's about the attainment gap, then you would invest in all two-year-olds because then you would capture the vulnerable two-year-olds. And I wonder whether you, if there is... You know, what, if you know why that wasn't done, because it's about evidence base, it's not about having a view on the policy, and whether it's still something that you would look at in terms of expanding down the way to two-year-olds rather than expanding out from older children. Do you know if it, if it wasn't done? Uh, I don't. I think the okay. suggestion from the Auditor General was that it wasn't done. Okay. No. Minister, the largest proportion and absolute difference between the Scottish Government's numbers and the Council's numbers uh, is in terms of infrastructure. Uh, so it's 400 million is the Government's figure and the Council's have it at 690 million of, of additional infrastructure spending that would be required. Could you elaborate on how the 400 million figure was come to? So, as you can imagine, we looked at the, what assets we already have in the country and um, took them into account when we were deciding um, whether this was um, possible to deliver this. Um, so, I, I think, you know, we'll agree that there are discrepancies between what we say and what um, local government say. I can assure you that those um, discrepancies are coming closer together as we speak. I understand that. What I'm trying to get to the bottom of is um, the 400 million figure that the government came to, was that as a result of an acknowledgement of how much money would be available to you or was 400 million identified by the process of, um, of identifying how much was actually required? Is, it, is 400 million based on creating a shopping list of everything that would be required or an acknowledgement of the financial situation the government's in and how much you would realistically be able to offer? Okay, I'm going to ask my colleague Joe Griffin to answer this for you. He's much more familiar with my so as with a number of our national um, figures, it's based on an economic model, which runs a certain set of assumptions about take-up, about the different service options, and then the principles that we shared with local government in advance of the planning process, which said that there's a, there's a hierarchy of how you use infrastructure. So you start with your existing assets, you look at reusing and so on and so forth, and a new build should be a, should be a last option then. So the 400 million was shared as an indicative figure to assist with that with that level of planning. Would you be able to tell us how much of the, for if, if it has been broken down as such, how much of that um, estimate was allocated to the, the purchase uh, of land rather than um, construction costs? Don't have that figure to hand. I, I, can, I can check back and we can, we can write to you. Uh, if, if, if we have that as a, as a clearly disaggregated part of the estimate, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would hope that the government did have that because it comes back to issues that I think we've raised previously in committee of policy coherence in government. So this would be another example where the issue of um, existing use value for purchase, council's purchasing power of land would perhaps come in. And if the government was taking an all government approach to this, um, that would make sense. The estimate from councils included over 400 million for new builds alone, uh, not just refurbishment or extensions to, to existing sites. And obviously there will be some difference in the figures and the minister's indicated that that difference is narrowing, but it indicates the scale um, of the construction that is required. Bearing in mind that we're not yet at a point of agreement and that a number of these construction projects will be quite considerable. On what basis does the government believe that 
this will be completed in time in the next two years, because construction takes time. Um, yes, it does. Again, we work, we work extremely closely with local government um, on the full range of issues to do with ELC, and, and infrastructure is one of those as well. Um, the message that I hear most clearly is that the end of April date for reaching a political agreement on a multi-year basis of funding really is very, very important in terms of those timescales. So that's what we're, that's what we're working towards. Um, and the understanding that we have in the conversations with local government is if we can meet that date, then the construction processes and so on can, can, can take place very quickly after that. And there is confidence that those construction processes can be completed in the next two years, because to me that, that begs the question, surely, if there is such a significant difference in the level of construction that's actually required, how can there possibly be an agreement on the time scale in which that can be completed? The Minister's already said that we're not in a position to sort of say how the negotiations are going, but we are confident collectively that we will reach a point very soon where there's a shared understanding of what's, what's required. So I think that could be quite a, quite a quick process. I, I haven't heard directly from any council that anything is impossible. I think we would all share the characterization that it's, that it's challenging, um, but I haven't heard from any council that they're in a position whereby it's, in, it's literally impossible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Minister, could I just ask you uh, about some comments that were in the Audit Scotland uh, report? Um, obviously, uh, very supportive indeed about the ambition of the Scottish Government's uh, policy. Um, but it does make the comment that um, the Scottish Government did not undertake effective analysis once the 600 hours provision was in place, and obviously that was uh, five years ago, and the Scottish Government had implemented the increase in hours without comparing the cost and potential outcomes of expanding uh, childcare and therefore without uh, looking at other possibilities of uh, spending the money, which you yourself said can't all be done in one uh, phase. And I'm of the same opinion as my colleague uh, Joanne Lamont, that I'm not an expert on what is the best thing to do, but. You said in an answer to Joanne Lamont that you didn't know whether any work had been done on this. Audit Scotland is saying that it wasn't done. Could you clarify who's correct? Well, I can look into it and write to you with a clarification. No, sorry, Minister. Are you of the opinion that Audit Scotland is correct when it flags up that there is a problem that not enough analysis was done of the 600 hours provision in order to inform policy. Is that correct or do you disagree with them? I think that the expansion to 1140 hours was announced back in 2014 and it was included as a manifesto commitment for our party, which then won the election. So I think, you know, I don't, I don't know that you know, that, that's why we've deli we're delivering on a manifesto commitment. I'm not sure. Perhaps I'm not understanding your question correctly. I don't think anybody's disagreeing about the laudable aims of, of the policy, and that's very clearly flagged up in Audit Scotland. It's obviously a very substantial amount of public money that's going into the policy. And what the committee is wanting in assurance office, as I'm sure many parents are, is that that money is well spent. And Audit Scotland is flagging up that it would have been helpful... Uh, to assess how well delivered the 600 hours had been and with good quality analysis, with a good quality data set to inform that. And yet you say to Joanne Lamont that you don't think that policy work has been done. That's a concern to me. So could you clarify whether you think that the work has been done? Okay, I think I understand what you're saying now. I think Audit Scotland also um, highlighted that there, are there, there is data collection in place for this expansion and that we have better baseline figures with which to compare it. Um, so um, I think going forward, there will be better data collection and there will be better analysis of what this expansion delivers. So we're not going to get the information until we've done another phase of development an implementation to know whether it's working or not? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think this was raised during the debate in Parliament by uh, one of my colleagues who quoted Harry Burns, who essentially said, we have enough evidence that this will work. Let's just get on and do it. Do it. Well, I think I beg to differ on uh, whether it's uh, satisfactory to put a policy 
uh, into implementation without having the, the adequate data set behind it to inform whether the judgment is the correct one. And, and we had this morning comment from Audit Scotland again that there are, there are issues about the data set being incomplete, uh, particularly when it comes to identifying where the most vulnerable uh, two-year-olds are. Uh, and, and that is a serious issue, Minister, because obviously we may have children missing out on, on their um, um, funding um, because of the fact that we don't know where they are. So again, it, does that not uh, reinforce the need to do uh, good quality analysis of just how effective the, the spend is? I agree. We're aware on the issue of two-year-olds um, and we're absolutely well aware that the uptake of entitlement for two-year-olds is lower than we would hope and we are taking steps to address that. Local authorities would find it very helpful to be able to identify potentially eligible families in their area and to target information to them much as they can down south in England. But that relies on us being on, on them being able to access information from the DWP and HMRC. And that requires an agreement from the UK government to share this data within an appropriate legal framework. Now, that requires them to pass some legislation, and I have to say I've been very, very disappointed with the response that I've had from the UK government when, I have contacted, when we've contacted them in the past to try to progress this. Um, the, I've written to them just this week um, to, the, um, um, to the UK government to express my disappointment again that the first set of regulations coming up under the public service delivery powers the Digital Economy Act, which is being um, introduced into uh, Westminster due to be introduced next month. They're not drafted to reflect the needs of Scottish local authorities, and I'm sorely disappointed with that. Uh, the issues that was flagged up this morning um, by Audit Scotland was the fact that um, part of the concern about uh, inadequate uh, data is, is not just to do with um, whether... Uh, all the information coming from Westminster is accurate, and I agree there is a point there. But the second uh, issue is that uh, some local authorities do not appear to have understood the strategic plan um, that they are supposed to be operating. Do you believe that there has been sufficient discussion with the Scottish Government and local authorities about uh, where their strategic plans uh, lie, and whether there, there is a good chance that they have the relevant data to be able to implement uh, this policy? I, I think, I, I mean, I do think so. So, so they were given information in the in the blueprint for 2020. They were given information last year, six months before we asked for um, detailed plans for them. So they had really good quality information on which to work. As well as that, we've had lots of face-to-face -face engagement between my officials and local authorities to try to help them to understand what was being required in terms of developing a plan. Um, and there's been, you know, as you can imagine, over the last few months, even closer engagement on that. So I think we are we are very close to having a shared understanding on um, what is required going forward. Yeah. And one one final point of clarification, if I may, uh, you mentioned earlier that you felt that the issue of flexibility would be partially solved, or hopefully in the long term, fully solved, um, by allowing um, the the money to follow the child. Uh, and your predecessor um, hinted in Parliament uh, three years ago that that would be a child account. Could you tell us if that child account is going to be the method by which you um, introduce money following the child, and if it is, when you think that will be in place? So at the moment, we're still developing the model. We've developed the national standards, and those are going out for consultation. And the funding follows the child model is actually in development. There's lots and lots of work going on around that. So I can't tell you what it's going to look like. As I said earlier, our current focus is absolutely on delivering this expansion. We expect um, funding follows the child to be in place, um, or, or nearly in place by 2020. But we're looking, you know, that's a. It, it, at the moment, our focus is on expansion. The funding follows the child, will follow the expansion. So, so just, can, just, can, just, I ask, can I ask so, Joe to clarify? So, so the government has said that while funding follows the child will not be on the, will, sorry, will not be on the basis of a, of a child care account system from August 2020, nevertheless, we wish to commission a feasibility study to look at what the, the aspects are involved in implementing such a thing. We're still in the process for tendering for an organisation um, to, to provide that feasibility study. 
clear, Mr Griffin, yeah. at the time when it was announced in Parliament um, before the Minister's time, um, we hadn't done any feasibility study at that time. Into a childcare account yeah. operating in Scotland, that's correct. Thank you very much. George, you wanted to come in very briefly. To very follow briefly. on from uh, Liz, it's just a very similar question to what I asked uh, the, uh, in the last one. So we've been, I asked a question about data with uh, regard to the individuals, uh, the, the young two-year-olds, and I was told it was there by Audit Scotland. Are you now telling me, and sorry if I sound like Lieutenant Colombo here, just for my own sanity, can you tell me now that uh, it's, we're actually having difficulty with HMRC and DWP in getting that information, which would help us get move everything forward in that case as well? Is that the situation we're in at this point in time? Yes, that is the situation that we're in at this point in time. We need the UK government to pass um, uh, legislation to enable that data sharing. And thus far, um, I've been disappointed. One of my biggest concerns in the uh, committees, other committees I'm on, and that's quite a few, Minister, uh, but they, they, we seem to have the same issue all the time with agencies actually sharing information with others. And it's never the lack of the information being there, it's actually getting the relevant information when we need it. What's really frustrating about this situation is that local authorities in England have the legislation already available mm -hmm. to share, to access that data. So they can access that data and target um, eligible two-year-olds um, or the two-year-olds who need it most. We can't. We're pressing to get those regulations passed. So thus far, I've been disappointed. I've written again to the UK government this week. We're determined to fix that. Meanwhile, we are doing everything else that we can within that is within our power to improve the situation. So we have staff and job centres trained to offer um, and raise the issue. We've been um, working with healthcare professionals who are working with these younger children who might raise um, the issue that there, are, that, that there is places available for eligible two-year-olds. Um, in some places, it's working quite well. So I visited a, a nursery in Olness recently in my own, um, you know, close to where I live at home, so in my own region. And actually, they, a third of their two-year-olds using the service were eligible two-year-olds. So they had a really good um, level of uptake in that local area. And I asked them how they had managed it, and they said it was word of mouth. So once people know that, these, that this is available, um, then they are... Um, using it um, but as I say information it is that lack of clarity to me seems bizarre it's absolutely frustrating I'm going to, to I'm going to move on to uh, the second theme uh, and we now move on to questions on care experience young people uh, I'd like to start by asking a question we've received from who cares Scotland some of who have joined us today welcome will the minister commit to ensuring that care experienced children and young people feel like they belong and are included in the communities where they live, ensuring they can access with ease opportunities to identify and develop their interests, skills, talents and ambitions. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's a single person around this table who would disagree with that. We are, um, this is something which unites the whole parliament, um, I would say. Um, and unites Civic Scotland. We are determined to improve um, the circumstances that looked after children find themselves in. Okay, thank you very much for that. And uh, Claire, you've got a question. Kinship, can uh, Thank you, convener. Uh, Minister, um, I, I get, I've been doing some work with Nurture Scotland in my area um, uh, with regards to kinship care. Um, the advice that's given to, to um, potential kinship carers and um, what, what level of um, support they're seeking from the local authority. And I, I understand the decision that's been made is, is about um, only giving um, sure, uh, Best Start grant rather to um, those who have um, the order in place. Um, my concern is, 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 is what work has the government been doing since the um, working group was established in 2017 to ensure parity across local authorities and areas that kinship carers are getting um, equivalent advice and that, that people are, 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 you know, who get to that point, um, there's a parity of how they've got there across Scotland. Thank you. I mean, it's a really challenging 
area to work in because it's so complex. I was um, at the launch of Kinship Care Week this week, just on Monday, um, and I heard firsthand from the people speaking at that event that every kinship arrangement is particular to that individual family. And I also heard how, you know, these it's often grandparents who take on the responsibility, often in an emergency situation. So they're not anticipating it at all. And suddenly they're, you know, taking on responsibility for extended family for young children that they haven't had responsibility for um, in, in a, you know, in a good number of years. Um, so I... I would say that it is a really complex area. Citizens Advice Scotland are working really hard to ensure that kinship and providing a kinship care um, advice um, service so that people are aware of what they're entitled to, um, to help them to navigate this really complex area. Um, but um, I'm more than happy to listen if you think there's more than, that we could do. In that case, Minister, I'm going to push my luck and ask if you would be prepared to meet with Nurture Scotland and myself to discuss some of the, the issues that raise, they've raised with me. Absolutely delighted to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Gillian. Thank you, convener. I'd like to ask you some questions around continuing care. Um, we had very powerful evidence last week um, from our panellists on, on this. Um, my first question is around the, the issue that... Um, Assessing the uptake of continuing care places and getting the message out to foster carers and to the young people that are uh, in, in foster care at the moment, about to reach the, the, the age of, 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 of 16 and uh, looking to their future. How is the, the offer around continuing care being communicated? So we are trying very hard to communicate the offering of um, continuing care and I, I share your concerns about how that is being um, applied on the ground. I mean, I think all of us as MSPs um, hear anecdotal stories um, that would cause us concern about how the, the, um, the continuing care, the policy of continuing care is, is operating. Um, the 2014 Act contained a a suite of groundbreaking measures to improve the outcomes and we are absolutely alive to the benefits of seeking continuous um, feedback from care experienced young people to improve all aspects of policy and implementation. So we as parliamentarians are regularly meeting with these people and feeding into the system. We um, as a government we're regularly meeting with them and hearing how it works and trying to improve the, the system. Um, we are all absolutely committed to improving the situation for these young people. Is there a varying picture across local authorities as to, you know, how, how effectively this has been done because obviously if, if young people aren't aware of what they're entitled to or foster carers aren't aware of, of the option to, to, to continue to have somebody under their care is it, is, it the same, is it the same with this issue of flexibility in childcare is it a varying picture across local authorities? I, mean, I think there is, it would be fair to say that there is a varying picture as there is for almost everything that we look at um, we are gathering data on that. As you know, there will be um, we won't we won't have the data um, until well, we'll have a first set of data later this month. I don't think we'll have really good quality data on continuing care until the following year. Unfortunately, I am meeting with Kezia Dugdale, who is a substitute member on this committee, later this month, and she's done some freedom of information requests around the country, which I'm hoping she'll be willing to share with me, which should give me a better picture of what's happening. And I absolutely stand ready to um, assess what's happening and try to make improvements on the ground. The care review is also looking at this area, as I'm sure you understood from last week, um, and they have very close con contact with many care experienced um, children and young people. They are very um, determined um, that the review will have an impact and also that we won't have to wait until the end of the review process to begin that impact. So I'm hopeful that with their reporting of the discovery phase of that care review due very shortly, there will be some um, meat for us to get into and try to improve the situation. 
say, as the convener mentioned, we've got who, some members of Who Care Scotland in, in, in a public gallery today, and I imagine that they will have a lot of evidence themselves about, about the uh, varying geographical picture. Um, I'd also like to ask about, we, we all know the statistics around um, homelessness, and that there is a shocking percentage of people <coughs> who are, are, are homeless having been care experienced, and I'm wondering what's, what's been done to... Uh, assess that but also to, to tackle that as well and to prevent that from happening obviously continuing care is a part of that but there's 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 more isn't there absolutely so on the specific issue of preventing homelessness i absolutely acknowledge that much more needs to be done to address the practice and indeed the cultural um, issues throughout scotland today we've made some progress on addressing homelessness and leaving care but we have to i mean it, it's all of our responsibility we have to make sure that people are not leaving care into homelessness. We've now um, got an improved framework um, introduced by the Children and Young People Act in um, Scotland 2014 um, and the independent review of care to help us to deliver better outcomes and to improve the quality of care for young people um, alongside the extension of legal rights to those leaving care. We issued some guidance on housing options for care leavers in 2013. The Minister for Local Government and Housing um, wrote to local authorities in 2017 for information about provision of housing for young people who have experience of the care system. Um, the Scottish Government, as you know, has worked with um, COSLA to introduce legislation to e expect um, to exempt care leavers from council tax and that will take effect from the beginning of the next council year in April. The Minister of Local Government and Housing also wrote to local authorities last summer about their approach to this issue and shared responses with the Local Government and Communities Com Committee as part of their inquiry into homelessness. So lots of them reported having protocols between housing and other departments and young people leaving care and champions boards and the like. Preventing homelessness amongst those at particular risk, including care experienced young people, is one of the issues being addressed by the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. And that group have consulted with those with experience of homelessness through a series of I We Can events um, facilitated by the Scottish Homelessness Involvement and Empowerment Network, part funded by the Scottish Government. This is an important part of developing their recommendations into their spring. And um, I welcome um, the re lo recent report on homelessness from local government and com communities committee committed to working with Mr Kevin Stewart, my colleague, on the various recommendations that have been made in the report. I just have to reiterate again, let me assure you, I am absolutely um, vexed by the stories that I hear time and time again, raised by my fellow MSPs about the situation out there for care leavers. And I am determined, absolutely determined, and there's a good team around me, absolutely determined to solve this problem and to improve the situation. Thank you for that answer. Just in the spirit of pushing your luck, just one final question, and I'm getting that look from the convener. Um, I'm pushing my luck because actually it's, it's on behalf of a friend of mine who's a befriender, and uh, she wanted me to ask about your continuing care in terms of foster care, but often befrienders have to move on past a certain point, but they have established a relationship with a young person. Would you look into that and actually uh, improving the extending the befriender um, case so that we can continue to have those links with, with the people, um, young people with their befrienders beyond 16? Absolutely, more than happy to look into that with you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're moving on to Ruth now, and can I remind both the uh, committee and the witnesses uh, to, to keep both questions and answers as succinct as we possibly can, please, Ruth. Uh, Minister, um, Kevin Brown's words from last week have been uh, on my mind quite a bit um, in terms of um, continuing care and um, homelessness with our care experienced um, people, children, young people. Um, and I think that as well as the sort of practical things and the, and the structural things, we have to hear him when he says that there's something a bit darker going on that we can take young people away from neglect and abuse, bring them into a system and then simply let them go. I think, um, you know, we don't do that with our own children and indeed even 
40 year old MSPs sometimes go back to their mum for support. So, um, <laughs> so you know, it, it's a serious thing. It, it, you know, we can't claim that we have a system that is, is loving our young people who are care experienced and then just, just drop them when they're young adults. What can we do about that culture that lets that happen and that we actually collectively allow to happen if, if, if we hear these things and, and, and don't change something? So we're required by law to take um, to evidence and consider together how to address the challenges of embedding real culture change across all aspects of the public center, sector with regard to corporate parents. I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I, so I hear these stories um, of where um, you know things are not working for people, from you know constituents' cases being raised with me by MSPs. And I, I'm shouting at, at the letter, where is the corporate parent in this? Um, because I absolutely agree that it shouldn't, you know, it, 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 there, are, there are times when we are, as a society, are falling short. And we need to challenge, we all need to challenge ourselves to improve that situation. All of the ministers are raising the profile of corporate parenting as part of their routine business with corporate parents. And um, we're trying to learn firsthand about some of the really good, there are, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's some really good work going on out there. So we're trying to find out about the good work and share the good work. Um, all of the corporate parents have to report to me, hopefully by the end of this month, um, their um, plan. And um, I will speak to parliament before the summer um, about the corporate parenting plans um, across Scotland. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ross. Thanks, convener. Um, Minister, to go back to my the theme of my previous question around policy coherence, the work that the housing minister has done, I think, is a positive example of, of policy coherence and, and not uh, preventing siloed working where you are the minister solely responsible for improving uh, the lives of care experienced young people. But there are so many other examples that that seem to be missed. An example that we used uh, previously with the Minister for Higher Education was around the cost of transport and how if we see student support as purely something delivered through support packages within the education portfolio, we're not going to achieve the change that's required. Could you explain how you ensure that a whole government approach is taken to improving the lives of care experienced young people, transport being a good example? I mean, that's a really challenging aspect of, of government, I agree, um, but we are, um, I mean, I would say that the care review being conducted by Fiona Duncan is, is absolutely a root and branch um, inquiry, and it's going into every area. It's speaking to care experienced um, children and young people. They're speaking to also folk who work in the sector, and they're absolutely, I am confident that they are getting a good picture of exactly what goes on. Um, and where the deficits are. And her challenge will be to come back to us and say, These are, this is what I've found, this is what I think can solve it. And um, we are, you know, I, I think you got the sense last week from Fiona Duncan herself just how um, committed she is to improving the situation. And we as a government are absolutely committed to um, acting uh, as well. When the, the government's response to the, the review, when, when it comes out, we'll be able to see clear evidence of a whole government approach being taken? Yes, I mean, I think it's absolutely it's going to take a whole government approach to solve this. It's going to take, I mean, let me reiterate again, it's going to take a whole society approach. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joanne? Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to go back to this issue about continuing care and follow on from uh, Gillian Martin and, and Ruth. Uh, Maguire's points, because I think in the evidence we heard last week, um, Kevin Brown spoke very powerfully, I think, and it's already been mentioned, this idea that a 16-year-old could be told, well, you could stay, but the finance is not there, which is just not what would be said to any other young person who wasn't clear experienced. Um, and we have had a briefing from Bernardo's, which is reflecting their experience that this isn't working and that there are problems. Um, they say that um, the, we have heard of continuing care placements being withheld from eligible young people and this being explained to them and their carers as a decision based on finance. So I wonder if you can confirm, A, that would be unacceptable, B, what resources are available specifically to support continuing care provision, 
And in your own um, submission to us, you talked about um, once you've met with Kezia Dugdale, you look at the statistics. Would it, presumably any FOI information she can get, you can get as a government. You don't have to wait for her to share it with you. And I wonder what conversations you've had with organisations, with Who Cares Scotland, with other organisations, indeed young people who are care experienced themselves about this specific issue. Because as I highlighted to you when you came with the order, I was concerned that government was promoting the order without asking the questions about whether actually there had been progress in the intention behind the order. So firstly, let me say that I absolutely agree with you. It's unacceptable if people are not, who are entitled to continuing care are not receiving it. Um, in terms of the resources that we've put into it, we've paid 4.2 million a year to Scottish local authorities since 2015-16 to support the costs of implementing continuing care. And this funding commitment rises to 9.3 million by 2019-20, at which point we expect the net total cost each year to stabilise. We also fund um, Celsius almost 5 million last year and, and the Realigning Children's Services Programme approximately 450,000 per year to provide capacity building in the sector um, and to support community planning partnerships respectively to improve outcomes for vulnerable children and families. I mean, we as a government, uh, um, the First Minister has commissioned the Root and Branch Care Review. We are speaking very regularly with um, people who are care experienced. You know, I come into this room and I, I see a number of friends, I would say, in the audience. I've only been in the post since last November. Um, so we are absolutely listening and we are absolutely determined to improve this yeah. situation. So, I mean, I agree completely with you on the importance of the review. And I think as a committee, we're hugely impressed with what we heard last week, um, particularly about the way in which they're going about their business and how they're actually trying to engage um, with, with care experienced young people and indeed you know, re responding to the fact that, that those um, care experienced people have forced themselves onto the political agenda. I mean, it's, they have done it and have been hugely effective and we, we applaud them for that. But I suppose my question to you is, what conversations are you having specifically about this issue, which anecdotally, I hear what you're saying about resources, that there has not been a translation from resources to um, care experienced young people having access to this right to continuing care. And I wonder, would it be something, I mean, as well as waiting for the statistics, as you say, and meeting with Kezia Dugdale, that you would actually be specifically pulling together these groups and organisations to talk to them about what their evidence is, which they themselves see as anecdotal, but it's obviously reflecting experience. I mean, I'm certainly willing to, to look at that. Um, as I say, I get a number of um, constituency um, issues raised on this. I am regularly looking at it. I am regularly looking at whether an issue raised by one local authority area or in one local authority area might also be replicated across the country. Um, I am more than willing to consider meeting with these groups um, to look at it more closely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary? Thank you, um, Convener. Joanne Laman has covered the issue of um, finance and um, continuing care. But I just want to touch on another issue that Bernardo's have highlighted in relation to this, because there's guidance. And there are three very narrow circumstances which local authorities should apply in a decision of not giving someone continuing care. Now, clearly, if people are being refused um, continuing care, on the grounds of resource, there is an issue with that guidance being implemented correctly in local authorities. How will you address that? So firstly, we gather the evidence and I'm grateful to everyone who is writing to me to tell me of these situations and I'm grateful for people who are talking to me to tell me about these situations. Then we go back to the local authorities and challenge them on it. The evidence is there. Bernardos are telling us there are three narrow grounds, so clearly those grounds are not being correctly applied. So you, you need to take steps to address that? Absolutely. OK. On the issue of young people, um, care experienced people and, and, and homelessness, and the point that I made last week um, in, in this committee, in 2012, I believe it was, the um, Equalities Committee in the last session of which I was convener, did an inquiry into young people in homelessness. Um, and a large percentage of young people that were homeless were care experienced. That was in 2012. 
six years on, we're still in the same situation. And I accept that you say that we have to make sure that people are not leaving care and becoming homeless, but the reality is that they are. Um, and young people don't need um, more consultation. They don't need, need more guidance. They need more support. Now, it's not just financial support. A lot of young people leaving care need emotional support. Um, and they need emotional support, to be frank, for as long as they need it for. Um, and, and there is a, a limit on the amount of continuing care that young people um, leaving care experience. Is that something you will review? Sorry, can you say again? So, there, there, there is a, a limit on the amount of care that a young person, um, a time limit on the amount of care that someone um, that's care experience will receive once they leave care. Now, as, as parents, whether we're parents or corporate parents, every young person is different. A young person of 18 might need emotional support for two years, three years, four years. Another young person might need emotional support for far longer. And as corporate parents, we have a responsibility to make sure that the young people that leave care get the right amount of emotional support that they need to enable them to sustain tenancies. Re re exempting them from council tax is not giving them emotional support. No, I would agree. That's um, just one of the many things that's required to help them to maintain their tenancies. Um, I would agree more needs to be done. I mean, I said that at the outset. We've made great strides, but absolutely more needs to be done. And we're determined to do it. But, but people are still ending up on the streets after leaving care. So clearly not enough is being done. That's more. And, and I think I, I think we would uh, uh, the government ministers would would accept that. Hence, many of the things that are being done now. We will be in a position in ten days' time or so to see the statistics. I think that will be. Uh, we could start a conversation now, but it will be a much stronger conversation when we have the statistics available to us. And and coincidentally, that will more or less align with the conversations, the meeting that the minister is having. Uh, with Kezia Dugdale. So there are a number of things here that interlock. First of all, it is very clear that in too many places in the country, local authority staff, for whatever reason, don't understand the legal rights that care experienced young people have. And we, and we would all view it as, as unacceptable that I think with absolutely no malice, but the wrong advice, the wrong official reaction is being given to, uh, to care leavers. And we, and I suspect COSLA, will want to work together to be able to make sure that th that aspect is rectified. But I think you're, you're right that it's not sufficient. We far better understand now not only the causes, but the nature of, uh, of the adversity that young people, not just in care, but including pretty much everybody who has been in care face, and then what we need to do about it. Um, the current uh, uh, law actually doesn't provide a maximum age. It permits local authorities to provide assistance at any age, but the, the, the greater the presumption in favour and the requirement is under um, age 26, but it's not, it's not limited to bricks and mortar. Um, it can be in any area at all, and in relation, for instance, to uh, uh, befriending was mentioned earlier on, mentoring, the role of a trusted adult in, uh, in people's lives, certainly in teenage years, is a proven pr protective, notwithstanding the adversity that they may have faced in their, in their early life. And our, our, our understanding of this, our scientific knowledge actually of it, is, has, been, has been jumping on over the years and we need to be able to respond uh, uh, to that. And we are working in, with mentoring programmes in my own area, in higher education, in relation to uh, uh, children from more deprived areas going into uh, training. And, and I doubt that we have reached the limits of that. There is, there is more that we need to do and benefit will come from it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and on that point, I'd like to draw the session to a close. Can I thank the Minister and, and her officials for their attendance? Uh, that brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting. We will now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>